This is the London Legal Podcast, presented to you by Hodge, Jones and Allen. Hello and welcome to this episode of the London Legal Podcast. My name is Chun Wong and I am head of the dispute resolution team at Hodge, Jones and Allen. Today we will be looking at some common issues that you might run into with your neighbours and how to deal with them. I have with me my colleague Stuart Miles, who is an associate in the property disputes team. Hi Chun, thanks for having me. We both obviously advise clients in relation to matters concerning neighbours, boundaries and trees and fences and how this can impact upon disputes between neighbours. So these matters can get very contentious. Thanks Stuart. So let's kick off with the issue of trees. Trees can be a great addition to a garden, providing much needed shade, privacy and amenity. However, they can also block light and cause damage to property. So trees can therefore be a source of highly contentious disputes between neighbours. So Stuart, what sort of things do you need to check first about trees, whether they're your trees or your neighbours' trees? Well, John, it's important to determine first who actually owns the trees. Uh, So checking them from the actual base of the trunks and trying to work out where the trunks originally grew from is, is a very good first step. Of course, in practice, this might not be as easy to carry out if the trees are very close to the boundary and have grown over time. Uh, obviously, you can be like fighting your way through lots of branches to get to the roots to check them. So checking old photos might help of your property in your garden, uh, as well as looking at the position as to what it is on the ground today. So once you've established whose land the trunk originates from, then you know that the landowner is likely to be responsible for maintaining that particular tree. Obviously, if the trees are at the boundary, then then you may have to check both your title documents and perhaps even your neighbour's title documents to see if they detail anything about the responsibility of the boundary and or even the trees themselves. So providing the titles are registered, then then it's quite easy really to order uh, office copy entries for the title deeds at HM Land Registry. Registered title documents are available to the public to obtain for a, a relatively small fee. Regardless of what appears in the title documents though, it is important to consider if there are any other agreements between the neighbours as to how the trees should be maintained that could be like a historical agreement and who is actually responsible or if any past conduct of maintenance should be taken into account too. Also, it's very important to check if the trees are protected by a tree preservation order, which is colloquially known as a TPO, or if the trees are located in a conservation area. And you can check this with your local authority. Uh, Some councils have this information freely online available to find and you can scroll through the websites to find this information and other councils can be contacted directly to find out if you're in a a conservation area or if if your trees are under a TPO. If the trees are protected by a tree preservation order, then you'll be prohibited from carrying out any cutting down, any topping, any lopping, any uprooting damage or destruction to the trees without getting the local authorities written consent. So there's a number of exceptions to this, such as, for instance, dealing with dead or dangerous trees that could create a nuisance or damage. However, without any such exemption, it is going to be an offence to carry out the prohibited acts without the written consent of the local authority. And if you're unfortunate enough to be convicted then you could be faced with a fine of around £20,000 or in very serious cases, it could be an unlimited amount. In relation to trees situated within a conservation area, you need to provide written notice to the local authority before commencing work on the trees. The notice basically allows the local authority six a six-week period to consider whether or not they're going to actually protect the trees with a tree preservation order if they deem that's necessary. Right, that's all very useful, Stuart. Now, another common issue which a lot of us must come across is when trees overhang into our garden and the leaves or the fruits are falling into the property 
So in these situations, Stuart, what can you do? Well, Chun, you do have a right to cut back any tree branches which are overhanging into your garden, providing you can do this, of course, without trespassing onto your neighbour's land. You should also ensure that you do not overstep the boundary line when carrying out any such pruning. You also need to make sure that you don't harm the tree when you're doing this. So of course, obviously, you could cut the tree and you could unfortunately kill it and your neighbour might not be happy with that. Technically, the offcuts of the branches still belong to your neighbour, so you should agree with your neighbour whether these should be returned to them or disposed of before actually starting cutting work on the overhanging branches. It would be sensible, really, to get any such agreement in writing so you can fall back on it if there's any confusion at a later date. Uh, Taking flowers or fruit from the branches that overhang into your garden is also technically a theft, believe it or not. Uh, It seems a bit silly, but (laughs) you don't really want to get into trouble there by taking your neighbour's property without their permission. (laughs) If the leaves are falling into your garden, then unfortunately it's not legally considered to be a nuisance. So you cannot ask your neighbour to sweep them up. You will instead wish to consider taking steps to remove the overhanging branches, as I described earlier, to minimise the amount of leaves falling down into your garden, which of course can be a nuisance to your own drains and drainage in your garden. Right, well thanks for that Stuart. Hopefully our listeners will find that useful as we come into the autumn months. Now, people may have heard about the dangers of tree roots and how much damage they can do to a property, particularly to the foundations of the property. Now, if you have concerns that there is property damage from tree roots, again, what should you do about it, Stuart? Well, obviously, this is always going to be extremely worrying, as roots can obviously do untold damage to buildings, foundations. If they make your property unstable, then clearly this would be a worry to you. And obviously, if the building was to topple over completely and and hurt anyone, then obviously there could be some third party liability there. So really, you would need to get an expert such as a structural engineer or a tree surgeon, perhaps, or even perhaps even both to confirm that there's a problem and get to, again, excuse the pun for this, but to get to the root of the problem. They, they could also then comment on what remedial action is required to protect your property. Open up a dialogue with the neighbours at an early stage is critical, really, as you likely need to access their land so that the expert can get on their land as well as your own land to assess the problem that's being created by the nuisance trees. As with everything, there's always going to be an expense to such reports, So you'll want to check any of your insurance policies, perhaps even your bank account details to see if you can cover the fees for any such expert report. And you might want to even look at whether or not your neighbour's insured as well. In any event, it's probably sensible to inform the insurer because it may impact the terms of your cover, subject to what the terms and conditions state in your own individual insurance policy. But ultimately, if you can establish that your neighbour's tree roots are damaging your property and your neighbour is refusing to engage, then you may need to look at an injunction being taken out against your neighbour to offer the maximum protection via court proceedings to get that. There would be the option, uh, and again, I think you'll probably be familiar with this, John, but the option of a self-help remedy whereby you take action yourself but without a court order, that's always a risky conduct to take. Mm, never advisable. Thanks, Stuart. That all sounds very serious and sounds like it could get very costly. Anyway, to move on from the topic of trees, another common theme in boundary disputes that we come across quite a lot relates to fences, particularly who owns the fence and who is responsible for maintaining them. Again, looking at the starting point. Is it true that you own and therefore you're responsible for the fences on your left side as you look down the garden? Well, unfortunately, Chum, that, that, that's a little bit of an old wives' tale. Uh, it's, it's not as simple as one person being responsible for the left-hand side of their garden. It's just a common myth, unfortunately. 
Again, you should check the title deeds to see what the situation is here, much the same as I said earlier. They could provide information about who is responsible for what, and you may have come across this yourself, and you probably have in your practice, whereby you will note that there's a T marked on a particular side of a boundary, and that can indicate who is responsible for what, depending on which way around the T is facing. If there's a T on both sides, then that could indicate that the responsibility is shared between you and your neighbour. If the deeds are silent as to who should maintain the fence, then you'll need to consider historic actions by the landowners, such as if anyone has maintained the fence previously. Also, if you've just moved into the property, then you should dig out what the seller inform you during the pre-sales forms that you get during the conveyancing process. You're probably unlikely to have all that correspondence, so it may be that you have to go back to your conveyancing solicitor to lay your hands on such information. And generally, they tend to keep their records for up to six years. So hopefully, if it's within that six-year period, you should be able to get your hands on the conveyancing documents. It's obviously worth remembering that the title deeds do not show the exact legal boundary. It's just a general boundary, unless there has been a determined boundary application that has been successfully made to the land registry. So the deeds should detail if the boundary has been determined pursuant to such an application. But if not, then it should be assumed that the boundary depicted on the title plan is only a general boundary. And obviously that, that's quite a frustrating thing for a property owner to hear, particularly when they want some definitive idea as to where the boundary is. But the case law makes it clear that there's no limit as to the quantity of land that could fall in with that general scope of the general boundary. Therefore, establishing the exact position on the ground of the boundary can actually be quite tricky. Mm, thanks for that, Stuart. So even if we've followed all the steps you've identified and it's um, clear who owns the fence and who is actually responsible for maintaining the fence, what happens if there is still a disagreement between the parties? Well, as, as with all disputes, John, you really want to be having early communication with the other party. So, so getting in contact with your neighbour and obviously trying to do it in a calm manner so as not to aggravate them and incur major legal costs. Reaching an amicable super solution in such a situation is always the best way to proceed to avoid such costs from escalating. If you can reach a solution, then you'll want to physically mark out the boundary and record where it is in a boundary agreement. And that can be registered against the title so that everyone will know what the position is if anyone checks their land registry in the future. If your neighbour is responsible for maintaining the fence and refuses to that extent that there is likely to be damaged onto your garden, then proceedings can be contemplated against your neighbour to address this. However, the issues need to be serious and it is a relatively high hurdle to achieve. Also, if there's a joint responsibility and your neighbour refuses to pay their share, then you could consider suing them for their share of the maintenance via a simple debt claim. However, you need to be live to the prospect that you could be seen to be assuming any future responsibility for the maintenance if you are therefore then taking it upon yourself to maintain the fence or the boundary or anything of that ilk and then seeking to sue your neighbour. So obviously that could prove costly if future damage was to occur. Thanks Stuart, I completely agree with what you said. And as you know, where possible, it's always best to try and resolve any issues you have with your neighbours amicably. I know that sounds strange coming from lawyers, but you have to see them day in and day out. So it's always best to keep relations civil. But more importantly, if a dispute was to escalate, you might have to disclose that to any potential buyer if you are considering selling the property in future. You could consider a more structured and formal alternative dispute resolution, such as mediation in these type of disputes. The Property Litigation Association and the Royal Institute of Charter Surveyors have launched a mediation service to try and help neighbours resolve disputes over their property boundaries without resorting to costly court action. 
So the Boundary Disputes Mediation Service is made up of a panel of mediators, lawyers and surveyors who are all experienced in neighbour and property disputes. So normally a fixed fee is agreed from the outset, which obviously avoids spiralling costs of litigation. And the parties can control the negotiation process, which means hopefully the mediators can convince even the most entrenched of neighbours to settle their differences. Generally, litigation over these type of cases can escalate and get out of hand very quickly, becoming quite disproportionate. This is particularly because these type of boundary disputes can be over relatively small strips of land, which hold a very small value. Some examples of this to illustrate the point is that in January 2022, parties spent over £200,000 on legal costs on both sides, and that was over a total of seven inches of land. In April 2022, Mr and Mrs New had to remortgage their home after they were fighting for 10 years over six inches of land. Now, in the event that you really cannot resolve the matter between yourselves, then proper legal advice should be sought at an early stage before you embark on any self-help, which actually could make matters worse or even prejudice your legal position. As Stuart said earlier, you should check whether you have the benefit of what's known as legal expense insurance as part of your home, contents or motor insurance, which might provide some indemnity for any legal costs you might incur in these type of cases. Be sure to follow Hodge, Jones and Allen on Spotify and on social media so that you can keep up to date with our podcast and all aspects of the law. We also have a blog on this topic with more details and advice which our listeners may find useful. If you have any questions or comments, then please do leave them below. And of course, if you found the podcast useful, then please do share it. Thank you for listening. You've been listening to The London Legal Podcast, presented to you by Hodge, Jones and Allen Solicitors.